Thank you, Steve. Uh, these are just a few of the books that discuss uh, the topic of free banking, and uh, lucky for you, I will summarize them all in the next hour. Uh, but I do want to point out that uh, Mises' Theory of Money and Credit and Vera Smith's uh, The Rationale of Central Banking are both available on the EconLib website, free download. Uh, my book, Free Banking in Britain, is available as a free download on the IEA site. And Human Action is available uh, for download on the Mises.org site. So some of these you don't even have to pay to read. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to uh, minimize the number of words on the slides because, after all, if you wanted to read, would you be attending a lecture? I came to this realization one time uh, watching CNN and all these headlines are crawling down the bottom of the screen. I said, if I wanted to read, would I be watching TV? Uh, there are basically two approaches to monetary institutions. There is what you might call the state theory of money. Uh, and there's the invisible hand theory of money. Now, if it were literally a picture of an invisible hand, <laughs> <laughs> there wouldn't be anything to show you, but uh, this is the logo of the Association for Private Enterprise Education, but meant to represent the invisible hand. Uh, and this is the wise king. This is actually a guy from an online poker so a site. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I'm going to, since this is advanced Austrian economics, um, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with Menger's theory of the origin of money and why the wise king theory uh, isn't necessary, how money can emerge out of barter spontaneously without anybody planning it, as if by an invisible hand, through the actions of traders who are just trying to make life easier for themselves to accomplish their trades more expeditiously. They will discover indirect exchange and they will converge on a common medium of indirect exchange. I used to spend more of the uh, lecture on discussing that, but uh, I eventually learned over the years that uh, since about two-thirds of the questions were on fractional reserve banking, <laughs> maybe I should devote more time to that. Uh, I assume you're familiar with why it was that gold and silver emerged as the common commodity monies around the world. They had features portability, divisibility, uniformity, uh, durability that made them more suitable as a hand-to-hand -hand medium of exchange. Uh, the picture here is, a, is of private gold coins, uh, so we could discuss why it is that governments have monopolized the coinage industry, but why they didn't need to do that as shown by evidence from the behavior of private mints that work quite well. Uh, the gov governments uh, became v involved very early on <laughs> in monopolizing the minting industry uh, and not because money is a public good. Right? The money in your pocket is not available for consumption by everybody else, so it doesn't have those characteristics, but because it's a source of revenue and because it's a source of propaganda. Uh, but I want to talk this morning about banking. So the origins of banking uh, historically can be found in the fact that uh, kings and princes and dukes were debasing their coinage. Well, I should say the involvement of banks in the payment system uh, lies in the fact that the government mints were debasing their coins and so there was a big business uh, in medieval bankers uh, weighing and assessing people's coins uh, because when you went from one city to another, they wouldn't accept out-of-town coins. They didn't know what they were worth. You had to go to a money changer, have your coins weighed, and then they would give you local coins with the equivalent amount of silver in it, minus a transaction fee. So the medieval banker you see is holding a uh, balance scale. They spent a lot of their time weighing coins. Right? The symbol in the street indicating that this was a banker's shop was a balance scale because that's where you went to have your coins weighed and assessed and uh, traded for local coin. 
In his other hand, he's got a quill pen. He's recording in his ledger book uh, somebody's uh, account balance. Right? So apparently the customer has brought him some coins. He's weighing them to see what they're worth. And he's writing down a credit to the, uh, to the customer's account. These kind of ledger book entries uh, were an important source, uh, important kind of bank liability. Uh, there's another important kind of bank liability which came along later but quickly became even more popular uh, than bank deposits and that's the bank note. This is a bank note from a London goldsmith bank dated 1729. Uh, I'll talk more about deposit banking and uh, the issue of bank notes uh, in a minute. Uh, but there's sort of two questions in uh, explaining how banks get involved in the payment system. One, why would anybody deposit money in a bank in the first place? And secondly, why would they start using their deposits as a means of payment? So here's Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice needs to make a payment to Bob. And let's suppose, just for the purpose of safekeeping, they both have coins stored uh, in this building. Right? Call it a bank, call it a warehouse, call it a vault, whatever you like. So uh, Alice wants to pay Bob. So Alice goes to the bank, takes out her coins, puts them in the wheelbarrow, drags them across town, rolls them across town, pays them to Bob. Bob says, thank you very much. Takes the coins out, counts them, puts them back uh, in his own wheelbarrow, takes them back to the vault because he doesn't want to keep them in his own house and deposits them in the bank. All right, so if you're making payment with coins but you don't want to store the coins at home, that's what's involved in making a payment. It doesn't take too much genius for Bob and Alice to say, hey, wait a minute, it's dangerous and troublesome to uh, be carrying the coins ac across town and back in our wheelbarrows. Why don't we just meet at the banker's office? And then we don't need the wheelbarrow. All right, so we'll meet at the banker's office. Alice takes the coins out, hands them over to Bob. Bob says, thank you very much, counts the coins, puts them back in the bank. Hey, wait a minute. Here's what's happening uh, on the bank's balance sheet. At the end of the day, Alice's account balance has gone down by $100, if it's a $100 <coughs> payment. Bob's account balance has gone up by $100. In order to accomplish that, we don't even need to take the coins out of the vault and look at them. Right? Alice, you trust the banker. I trust the banker. Why don't we just tell the banker, make this transfer on your books. Right? That's what it's going to be at the end of the day anyway. There's no need to take the coins out. So at that point, when Alice pays Bob not by handing over coins, but by instructing the banker to make a transfer on the ledger book, we have bank issued money. We have a payment being made not with coins, but with claims on the banker. So claims on the banker become a medium of exchange, become a payment instrument. Right, so at that point, banks have entered the payment business. So why have they done it? Because it's more convenient for Alice and Bob. In 1200 AD, customers literally met in the banker's office and told him, swore an oath that they really wanted to make this transaction. They were big on swearing oaths in the Middle Ages. Uh, but that might not be the most convenient way to make the transfer. Here's another way that came along a little later. Alice writes on a slip of paper, Dear banker, please transfer $100 from my account to Bob's account. Signed, Alice. We call that a check. She gives the check to Bob. Bob goes to the bank to deposit it in the bank. Still no wheelbarrow needed, but now only one person has to visit the bank. Well, we can trace the subsequent steps in the development of payment instruments as more and more convenient ways to signal the banker to make the transfer from one account balance to the other. So instead of Bob visiting the bank with the check, it could be Alice visits the bank and gives him an order to make the transfer to Bob's account, and Bob knows he's been paid when the money shows up in his account. That's called a GIRO system. Right, so the payer initiates the transfer instead of the payee bringing in a, a slip of paper. Uh, today we have electronic funds transfer. 
Right? So you swipe your card at the grocery store, and that's the signal to the bank to transfer the money from your account to the grocery store's account. Or you swipe your card at the gas pump, and as the gas goes in your car, glug, 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 and the uh, pump is recording the gallons over at the bank, your bank account is going down, glug, glug, glug. Well, not really. They wait till the end of the transaction. Okay, so that's banks getting involved in the payment system. Now, what kind of institutions uh, are going to carry out this business? There's kind of two basic possibilities. We could have uh, what we think of as ordinary commercial banks, various sizes, <laughs> all the same shape, but various sizes. Uh, or we can imagine an institution which is basically a warehouse, a money warehouse. Uh, and the question of fractional reserve banking is, what's going on sort of behind the door? Uh, any pop culture fans who recognize this uh, building on the right? Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck. So that's what's going on behind the scenes in that institution. Uh, so here are the two models. Uh, the first one I call a money warehouse. It's hard to find any examples in actual history of a money warehouse. But uh, here's a fictional example, Gringotts Bank from Harry Potter. And if you remember, and I'm sure you do, <laughs> when they visit the bank, they go deep underground and there are little cavelets where the money is stored in bags. Right? It's basically a warehouse or a system of safety deposit boxes. So in a money warehouse, um, by the way, some people want to call this a warehouse bank, but it's not a bank in the usual sense because it doesn't make any loans. Right? A bank is usually defined as an institution that takes in deposits and makes loans. This is not making any loans, it's a warehouse. All right, so in a warehouse, what, uh, and actually it's probably not correct to say owed to, it's not that the warehouse has debts to its customers, it's simply a custodian of its customer's property. But if it's keeping track, uh, Alice has $10 in claims on the warehouse. Bob has $10 in claims on the warehouse. Other people have $180. If the total claims are $200, then it's got $200 in property stored in the vault. This is the sort of arrangement people often choose for storing their valuables. It's available today in the form of a safety deposit box. Or if you have something bigger, right? you can rent space in a warehouse. Uh, in medieval times, people who just wanted their coins stored would bring them to the institution, call it a bank, just for the sake of argument, uh, bring the coins to the bank in a sealed bag. And that was the indication that they didn't want the coins tampered with, and the bank would just find a place in the corner of the vault and put the coins in. But go back to my story about Alice and Bob. If they want to make payments, uh, having the coins in a sealed bag and then having the banker hand over the bag and having to open the bag and take the coins out and then redeposit them isn't the most convenient way to go. Uh, there may be a more economic alternative if the reason you want to use the services of a banker is not for storage but for making payments. Uh, in particular, uh, the possibility of fractional reserve banking arises. So, here's a fractional reserve bank, the Medici Bank being one of the early ones. So, it has $200 in claims, but it's only got, say, $40 coins in the vault at any particular time. And the other $160 is lent out uh, or invested in commercial paper or bills of exchange. That was a big deal for banks in the 19th century, bills of exchange. So, IOUs issued by businesses that were kind of like loans except that they were easier to resell. Uh, they were a kind of security. So is there an advantage to the bank in op running operations this way? Well, it's pretty clear. They're going to earn more interest income. Well, they're going to earn some interest income. The warehouse can't earn any interest income. Right? Uh, now, some people looking at this uh, and comparing it to the warehouse bank, the, sorry, money warehouse, 
say, oh, well, the bank is ripping its customers off. Uh, they wouldn't agree to this deal where the banker gets to lend their money out. It makes their claim less secure, and all the benefit goes to the banker. Well, are there any advantages to the customer of this arrangement? Yeah, if it's a competitive system, sure. In order to attract customers, banks are going to be forced by competition to start waiving storage fees. They don't need to charge storage fees. They're not storing as much in their vault. Uh, and paying interest on accounts. Right? So if you want secure storage, you may be willing to pay storage fees. If all you want is payment services, you may be happier with a system that pays you instead of demanding to be paid storage fees. Uh, so in a competitive system, the advantages to the customer are it's a more economical way of making payments. Uh, here's a bank note issued by a fractional reserve bank. I, I picked this example because it's more explicit than most about what kind of claim it is. It says redeemable in gold coin. Uh, it also says this note secured by bonds of the United States. That was required under the regulations uh, that the government issued, but it's a clear indication that the note is not 100% warehouse receipt. Um, it's secured by some other asset, just like in the bank we looked at. Uh, it's not that the bank's assets are only a fraction of its liabilities. It's that the bank's coin assets are only a fraction, and the rest is other kinds of assets. So in the event the bank needs to pay more than $40 out, it has something it can sell uh, to raise the money. Anyway, redeemable in gold coin, and here's the, the language of the contract. You can read it. Uh, the First National Gold Bank of San Francisco will pay $100 in gold coin to the bearer on demand, uh, is what it says over there, and then it's signed by the officers of the bank. And if we could only impose on the Federal Reserve System the obligation that every note has to be individually hand-signed by the officers of the bank, <laughs> I think we'd have an anti-inflation policy. Uh, the, the reason it's so explicit about the gold is that this was issued uh, during the Civil War, sorry, the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, <laughs> when I taught at the University of Georgia, I had to learn the... It was actually, actually the War for Southern Independence is what they called it on the historical markers. Uh, but California, while the Union went on the greenback standard, uh, irredeemable paper money standard, California remained on the gold standard. And so in California, banks wanted to make it explicit that what you were being promised was not greenbacks but gold coin. Uh, here's another banknote. Uh, Provincial Bank of Ireland Limited. Limited means it's a corporation, right? If, if we become bankrupt, we don't have to pay our debts any further than that. But notice what it says up here in the corner, unlimited for note issue. So if no, all the note holders don't get paid, you can come after the shareholders and they have to keep paying until all the note holders are paid back. So that's another way to kind of secure the note more than the other claims against the bank are being secured promise to pay the bearer. So it's a slightly different language. Right? Not will pay the bearer on demand, but promise to pay the bearer on demand, five pounds uh, at Belfast. But it's basically the same idea. It's a debt claim. It's a promise to repay. It's an obligation to repay. It's an IOU issued by the bank. Right? By contrast, here are some warehouse receipts. Uh, and they look much different. And so I've heard it claimed that banknotes are pretending to be warehouse receipts, but they don't say warehouse receipt on them. Right? They say, we'll pay the bearer on demand. Uh, here's a actual warehouse receipts. The language is very different. So it's not hard if you want to identify the claims you're issuing as warehouse receipts to differentiate them from banknotes. So grain inspection department, public warehouse receipt, uh, but it's a private company that's issuing it. Grain of the kind, amount, grade, and condition described herein has been received for storage and upon surrender of this receipt uh, will be delivered to the order of. Right, so people are storing their grain in the warehouse. Now, 
Grain is uh, fungible, and the sort of the technology of grain storage is that it's easier to put the grain in at the top of the silo and take it out at the bottom of the silo. So you're not being promised that you get your very own grain back, not the same kernels that you deposited. You're getting back grain of the kind, amount, grade, and condition that you brought in. Right. People agree to that because it's more convenient. They don't have to pay as much in storage fees. I suppose you could have a grain warehouse where people bought the grain in in sacks and you didn't open the sacks and you gave them back the same sacks they brought in, but people agree that it's ag agree to this kind of warehouse because it's more economical. Uh, here's a warehouse receipt issued by the uh, American Liberty Dollar people. Uh, and the language is explicit. This is a warehouse receipt for one troy ounce of 0.99 fine silver stored at the warehouse, identified below. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, enterprise. You, you may have heard that this company was busted for uh, violating the federal laws against minting coins, uh, privately minting coins. Uh, they weren't busted for issuing these receipts, those haven't been challenged legally. Uh, now, uh, let's see, keep reading. Um, it says that the uh, silver is insured against fire and theft, etc. Storage and insurance fees have been prepaid for five years from date of issue. Right? So if you go and redeem it in the next five years, you get back the ounce of silver. After that, uh, fees are added at 1% per year, the value of silver prorated at the time of surrender. So the storage fee after the first five years is 1% per year, and that's pretty typical uh, for gold and silver storage. Okay, but uh, it's, it's very differently worded than a banknote, so the distinction is pretty clear. Okay, so how is uh, it feasible for a bank to issue these claims that say redeemable in gold coin to the bearer on demand when they have less than one gold coin, or if it's $100, they have less than $100 in gold coin for each $100 note that's in circulation. Uh, how is it feasible? We can talk in a minute about whether there's something fishy about it from a legal standpoint, but how is it feasible? How can the bank survive? How can they carry on operations continuously? And banks have succeeded in doing this for decades uh, without ever failing to meet all the redemption claims that actually came to them. How is that possible? Mises offers the following uh, contrast. He says, suppose you issue tokens that say good for one loaf of bread and you issue a hundred tokens. How many loaves of bread do you need? Well, you better have 100 loaves of bread. In that case, a fractional reserve isn't feasible. Why? Because these tokens aren't good for anything except getting a loaf of bread, so you can be pretty sure that everybody who's got a token is going to bring it in to get a loaf of bread. Right? You can't eat the tokens. But a banknote is different. Why do people bring their money to a bank uh, when they want payment services because it's a more convenient way of making payments. To make payments they don't need to bring in the banknote and redeem it for the coin and then use the coin to make payments provided the <clears throat> other party to the transaction is willing to accept it they can make the transaction, they can make a payment with the banknote itself. So the banknote serves the same purpose, discharges the same function that the coin discharges. Right? You don't need to redeem it in order to use it in the way you want to use it. It's kind of like if a bakery issued crackers that were stamped good for one cracker. <laughs> right? You don't need to go back to the bakery in order to have something to eat. Uh, but it, it's not a very good analogy because right, the banknote is not consumed. It's circulated. It's passed from party to party. And among people who uh, recognize this bank and are confident in the value of the note, uh, it serves as a means of payment. So 
when people discover that they can use claims on banks as a means of payment, either banknotes or deposit claims, even if everybody wants to make a payment every day equal to the value of their account balance, it doesn't mean a drain of gold from the vault every day equal to the size of these claims. Only a fraction are going to be redeemed every day or on any particular day. So the bank, uh, the way Mises puts it is, it's enough if the bank keeps a reserve large enough to meet all the redemption claims that actually come to it. It doesn't need to keep 100% reserves in order to meet all the claims that actually come to it. It can be confident that not 100% are going to come in uh, on any given day. Now there are assumptions built into that, like there's not a bank run every day. <laughs> but the historical evidence is pretty clear that there isn't a bank run every day. Uh, and we'll talk about when there is a bank run and when there isn't a bank run uh, later on. Uh, okay, so that's what makes it feasible. Now, the banker has a practical problem. He has to figure out how big a reserve is going to be sufficient to meet the redemption demands that are likely to come in or to meet 99.9% .9 of the demands that are going to come in uh, or maybe I should say are going to be what reserve is big enough that I can be 99.9 .9 or whatever level you like percent sure that the claims that come in are not going to be bigger than that reserve but that's that's the kind of practical problem that banks are good at now uh, I've heard the argument uh, that a banknote is equivalent to a lottery ticket uh, a fractional reserve banknote is equivalent to a lottery ticket because if there, so the argument goes, if there are only 20% reserves, then people who are aware that there are only 20% reserves are only going to treat the $100 banknote as the equivalent of $20, or, or uh, they're going to treat it as a lottery ticket such that they only have a one in five chance of actually getting their money back because there's only enough gold to pay back one out of five. Sorry, it's time to take my pills. <laughs> uh, I'll put it off. Uh, well, is it a lottery ticket? Well, if there were a bank run every day, and if the bank had no other assets than its gold reserves, uh, and if the redemptions were randomly chosen, a uh, hundred people show up and they say randomly, okay, you, you, and you get to redeem, then it would be like a lottery ticket. Right? But the facts are it's, there isn't a bank run every day. The bank has other assets, so even if everybody wants to redeem, uh, if the bank has enough time to sell its other assets, it can pay everybody off. Uh, so it's not, in practice, valued like a lottery ticket. We've got plenty of historical examples uh, of banknotes with fractional reserves that don't circulate at 20% of their par value or whatever the reserve ratio is. They circulate at par. Now, if you get hold of one of these notes and you're worried that the bank isn't going to pay, what do you do? You take it to the bank and redeem it. So people who regard it as a lottery ticket can cash it in at face value. Uh, it's not really a lottery ticket for them. And people who regard it as safe enough to circulate it's not a lottery ticket to them. So my conclusion is it's not a lottery ticket. <laughs> right? uh, the probability of redeeming it successfully is close enough to 100% that it, it's silly to call it a lottery ticket. Yes, there is some risk. There is some risk. But as I said, there are banks that have gone for decades meeting all the claims that uh, have been presented to them without any problem. So it's a little safer than a lottery ticket. Uh, okay, let's talk about the legal issue. This is the Pinocchio Bank. Uh, <laughs> is it a fraud? Is there something illegitimate going on where the bank is promising more than it can deliver uh, and thereby uh, defrauding its customers? Well, let's be clear about what a, a fraud is. A fraud is a deliberate deception uh, for the purpose of gain. Uh, so, are the customers being deceived? Uh, Murray Rothbard's argument many years ago uh, was that nobody would agree to deposit 
in a bank with fractional reserves, so if they have any customers, those customers must have been fooled, must have been deceived. Uh, the fractional reserve bank is a fraud against the depositors in that bank. But we've already right, considered the argument, I've already given you an argument that there are good reasons people would put their money in a fractional reserve bank. They don't have to be defrauded into doing it. It offers them a better deal provided that their purpose is to make payments rather than just safe storage. Um, in uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto's book on banking, he makes arguments based on the assumption that the only purpose for which people put money in a bank is safe storage. Well, if that were true, they would, it's quite plausible that they would want to avoid a fractional reserve institution. But that's not the only purpose. And if you assume it's the only purpose, you're, uh, you're sort of begging the question. So, um, if people are agreeing to a fractional reserve bank because it gives them a better deal, and they regard the risk as sufficiently small to be outweighed by the better return, they get paid interest on their bank account. Oh, and by the way, if you see a bank offering to pay you interest on your demand deposit, it's a pretty clear signal that it's not a warehouse. Because <laughs> warehouses charge storage fees. A bank that's offering to pay you interest they must be earning some interest from the money being deposited. There's no other way to do it. So if they're not charging you storage fees and they're offering you interest, pretty clear uh, that it's a fractional reserve institution. So I don't see any reason to suppose that people are being misled. Um, well, there, there seems to have been a change in the argument among uh, Rothbard's followers. The argument these days is either not that they're defraud is not that they're defrauding the customers necessarily the customers might agree to it but the bank and the customer together are somehow defrauding third parties or that there's some kind of legal absurdity going on uh, that the bank is issuing more claims is issuing multiple claims to the same property right so you bring a coin into the bank and get a deposit balance or an account balance at the same time, they lend the coin out, so now the coin has two owners. Right? So that's the second argument that, that's made. Well, uh, look, the, uh, the coin doesn't have two owners. The person who brought the coin to the bank relinquished ownership of the coin. What he now owns is an IOU from the bank. It's a debt claim. And if you tell me, no, no, it's a warehouse claim, right? you, you've begged the question of why can't it be a debt claim? Uh, people could agree to make a loan to the bank. Here's another way to think of it. A, a time deposit is clearly an IOU of the bank, right? If the, if the deposit says you can't get your money back until five years are up, clearly people are lending the money to the bank. Okay, how about a one-year time deposit? Okay. How about a one-day time deposit? Okay. How about a time deposit that says you're lending money to the bank until you show up to claim it back? Right? So the, the term isn't pre-specified, it's whenever you show up to claim it back. Is that a, an okay kind of contract? Sounds like it's not absurd to me. It may or may not work in practice. We have an argument as to why it can work in practice, but it's hard to see how it's legally absurd. And it's certainly not that two people have uh, exclusive title to the same coin. The person who brought the coin in and got the deposit balance doesn't have a coin anymore. He's got a claim on the bank. Um, Right? And in the Middle Ages, this was sorted out pretty early, when people stopped bringing money into the bank in sealed bags, right, which is a clear indication that they wanted storage only, and started bringing in loose coins and expecting to get paid interest. Right? They're clearly authorizing the bank to lend the money out and pay them some share of the proceeds. Right? Otherwise, they would have brought it in in a sealed bag. Uh, <laughs> now, let me say a little more about this argument that uh, there's something logically or legally absurd about the uh, fractional reserve bank claim. So, let's consider a little logic exercise. What do you think of the following argument? A dog has four legs. A cat has four legs. A goat is neither a dog nor a cat. Are we okay so far? Conclusion, therefore a goat does not have four legs. <laughs> Uh, this is an invalid inference. 
the conclusion is true, <laughs> right? But the argument is invalid. Right? It doesn't follow from the premises. Okay, how about this one? Uh, a money warehouse contract is legitimate. Okay. A time deposit contract is legitimate. Okay. A demand deposit contract is neither a money warehouse contract nor a time deposit. Also true. Therefore, a demand deposit contract is not legitimate. <coughs> Doesn't follow. Right? And this, as I read it, is DeSoto's argument at, at great length uh, in the first three chapters of his book, Money, Bank, Credit, and Economic Cycles. He keeps emphasizing how in Roman law, a warehouse contract was considered legitimate, a time deposit contract was considered legitimate, but look, a demand deposit is neither one of those two. Therefore, a demand deposit contract is not legitimate. Now, maybe he's got some other argument for why it's not legitimate, but I couldn't discover it. Now, um, I posted a, on an obscure website a review of the book in which I said, I caricatured the argument in this way, uh, and Joe Salerno responded and said, now wait a minute, there's another way to interpret uh, De Soto's argument, if you, in, if you in, uh, where did De Soto's argument, if you insist on making a syllogism out of it, how about this? Valid syllogism. Any deposit contract that is neither a money warehouse contract nor a time deposit is illegitimate. A demand deposit contract is neither a money warehouse contract nor a time deposit. Therefore, a demand deposit contract is legitimate. <laughs> this is a perfectly valid syllogism, right? But it, it commits another no-no, uh, which is to beg the question. Right? If we start with the premise that you have to be a money warehouse contract or a time deposit to be legitimate, well, I thought that's what we were debating. <laughs> right? So I, I'm open to uh, suggestions for another way, but yeah, if you start with that premise, sure, <laughs> you can derive the answer, but why do we start with this premise? It's true that in Roman law, demand deposits were not recognized. That's because they hadn't been invented yet. Right? But I don't, don't know what the argument is for why we should be limited to what Roman law recognized. Okay, so let me move on to some of the properties of a free banking system. Uh, one question that, uh, so here are the, uh, on the left are the banknotes currently available in Northern Ireland. There are still four private banks of issue. In Scotland, there are still three private banks of issue. Uh, in the United States in the 19th century, there were many, many banks of issue. Um, and in other places, in other times, there have been dozens of banks of issue. And a question that often arises, a concern people have, especially based on American experience, is are all these notes in the same place going to be interchangeable? Or are you going to have floating exchange rates? Is a five pound note issued by the Bank of Ireland equivalent to a five pound note issued by the Northern Bank? Or do you have to check the exchange rate table in the newspaper every day to know what these different notes are worth? Well, no. If you're a business and you want to accept checks, all you have to know is that your bank accepts the check, and if they do, you can be pretty sure they accept it at face value. Uh, and so all these notes are interchangeable. They all circulate at face value. They all circulate at the uh, five pounds that they are claims to. And if you can read the language, it says, promise to pay the bearer uh, on demand five pounds sterling. Nowadays, that means five one-pound coins, <laughs> which are made out of cupro nickel, but Back in the old days, it meant uh, gold coins or silver coins. Uh, so why will, why will they uh, circulate at par value? Because it's in the interest of the banker to make them circulate at par value. If you're a banker whose notes will only be accepted at a discount or not accepted at all, people will immediately want to redeem them. Because right? if you can buy them at a discount and redeem them at face value, if you can buy them at 90 cents and redeem them at a dollar, you'd do that and they'd go out of circulation. Uh, that bank's not going to do much business. So banks want to ensure that their notes circulate as widely uh, and at face value as they can arrange, given the cost of arranging it. So historically, banks have been very diligent to try to ensure that their banks will circulate widely because it attracts more customers. Uh, so here's some history of how they uh, 
discovered that this was in their interest. Uh, my first book, uh, Free Banking in Britain, has a chapter on the history of banking in Scotland. And I could tell you lots of his hilarious stories because Scottish bankers are, as you know, fun-loving people. <laughs> uh, but here's one story. The Bank of Scotland is the first bank chartered in Scotland. In those days, you had to go to the legislature and say, please give me permission to open a bank. So the Bank of Scotland is chartered by the Scottish Parliament in 1695. The Scottish Parliament goes out of business. Uh, when the Bank of Scotland says, hey, uh, our charter's about to run out. We need to get it renewed. They couldn't go to Edinburgh. They had to go to London to get it renewed. And in London, they didn't have so many friends as they had in Edinburgh. And Parliament said, no, nah, we're not going to renew your charter. Uh, sorry, we're not going to We'll allow you to stay in business, but we're not going to renew the uh, promise we made that you, you get to be the only bank in Scotland, which was the promise the Bank of Scotland initially had. Uh, and a few years later, they chartered the Royal Bank of Scotland, and the name is pointed. Right? The Bank of Scotland was suspected of being sympathetic to the Scottish separatists, right? the uh, Mel Gibson and those guys. Uh, <laughs> They weren't finally stamped out until 1745. Bonnie Prince Charlie was uh, defeated. So in 1727, there were still those guys around. Bank of Scotland was suspected of being disloyal to the British king. So the, parliament, the British Parliament charters the Royal Bank of Scotland. It's going to be loyal to the crown. Uh, they set up shop in Edinburgh. And uh, the Bank of Scotland says, well, we're not going to have anything to do with this upstart bank. Everybody banks with us. If we just ignore this new institution, we can kind of freeze them out of our payment system, uh, and they won't ever get off the ground. The Royal Bank of Scotland said, well, let's see, we don't really have the option to refuse to deal with the Bank of Scotland. Their notes are quite popular. If we want to attract depositors, we have to agree to accept Bank of Scotland notes. So they agree to accept them. They open up their bank, and they say, come deposit your Bank of Scotland notes and we'll give you an account balance or we'll be happy to swap you our own notes. And they were actually quite aggressive in trying to go out and persuade people to swap their Bank of Scotland notes for Royal Bank notes because they wanted the Royal Bank wanted its own liabilities in circulation so they could make the loans instead of the Bank of Scotland and earn the interest income. But here's the uh, kind of diabolically clever thing they did. Instead of taking the Bank of Scotland notes they got every day back to the Bank of Scotland that evening and saying, please pay the bearer on demand, right? give us the silver to cover these notes. They let them pile up. <laughs> and they let them pile up and they let them pile up for a few months. Maybe you can see where this is going. Oh, yeah. Then they borrowed the wheelbarrow from Alice and Bob. They took them over to the Bank of Scotland, dumped them on the counter and said, pay the bearer on demand. Uh, it was actually silver in those days. Uh, and the Bank of Scotland said, oh. <laughs> We never had this many notes come in for redemption on one day. They were not prepared, uh, and they had to put out a sign, no more silver today, after they had paid off all the notes. And they took their time paying as long as they could. They hired a guy and told him to, uh, or they actually brought their janitor out from the back because he couldn't count and said, here, you pay the notes. And so he kept miscounting and knocking over <laughs> piles of coin. Uh, but eventually they ran out of delaying tactics, and they had to ha hang out the sign that said, uh, sorry, we're out of silver. Now, they weren't insolvent. They still had assets, right? But they didn't have silver anymore. So it was, uh, you'll have to uh, wait until we sell enough of our assets or get enough loans repaid that we can resume silver payments. So during that period, the Royal Bank said, hey, we're the only bank in town that pays silver. And they attracted a lot of business. When the Bank of Scotland got up and running again, they said, okay, two can play at this game. They started accepting Royal Bank notes and letting them pile up. And then every so often they would raid the Royal Bank and try to embarrass them. But when both banks know that this is coming, they just have to hold more coin. And so eventually they figured, let's see, this is a repeated game, and we know from game theory. <laughs> It pays to cooperate. We're not going to drive each other out of business. We're just making business more expensive for both of us. Let's get together once a week and just swap the notes we've collected and then just settle the difference in silver and then we can both go back to holding smaller silver reserves and make more interest income. 
So that was kind of how they discovered that it was in their interest to accept the other guy's notes at par, so they had something to bring to the note exchange every week. Uh, and they continued to do that, and uh, the note exchange eventually uh, spread. A uh, slightly different story in uh, Boston in the 1830s, it was a situation where notes from the banks outside of Boston wouldn't be accepted by stores in Boston, uh, and the banks in Boston wouldn't accept them at face value either because to redeem them meant taking a trip out to the countryside uh, and it was cumbersome and there was some risk that the bank wouldn't be there when you got there to redeem them. So there was a secondary market in banknotes. There were, just like in medieval Italy, there were coin changers. There were note changers in Boston. They had an inventory of Boston banknotes. They would buy out-of-town banknotes at a discount and then collect them and go back to the countryside to redeem them. The Suffolk Bank said, hey, wait a minute. We should get into this business because we don't have to keep a costly inventory of other banks' notes. We can just issue our own whenever somebody wants to buy local notes. And if we do that, we can get more of our own notes in circulation. We can buy the country notes and take them out of circulation, replace them with our own notes. We get a bigger share of the circulation. And we earn more interest income. And other banks figured this out too, and the competition among these banks, trying to replace the other notes with their own notes, basically drove the discount rate on out-of-town notes down to zero. They started accepting these notes at face value. Now, a uh, sort of funny footnote to this, the Suffolk thought that by buying the out-of-town notes and replacing with their own notes, they could get a bigger share of the circulation. Uh, this is kind of like the theory that you can reduce the number of mosquitoes on your property by hanging out a blue light that attracts mosquitoes <laughs> and then kills them. But first, it attracts them. <laughs> so you're doing your neighbor a, a, a favor, but I'm not, I don't understand the theory according to which you're doing yourself a favor. Uh, and the Suffolk discovered that, wow, the country banks seem to be issuing more notes than ever. And the country banks discovered that, hey, this is great for us because the higher the price our notes fetch in Boston, the more people are happy to take our notes into Boston instead of redeeming them and taking silver into Boston. So both the circulation of both banks' notes increased, both the Suffolk Bank and the country banks. Uh, at the expense of what? At the expense of coin. People could use bank, more banknotes and less coin. The, the Suffolk became the dominant player in this business because here's the breakthrough they made. Rather than collect the notes and take them back to the countryside to redeem them, they said to the country banks, here's the deal, keep an account with us, and then we'll just debit the notes against your account balance, and every so often we'll ask you to top up your account balance. But there's a lot less schlepping of notes and coins, this is a technical term I learned in New York, a lot less, <laughs> a lot less schlepping of notes and coins if we do it this way. And so the, every, all the country banks said, okay, great, we'll open an account with you. Now the Suffolk footnote Again, the, the Suffolk didn't pay interest on these accounts of the country banks, and so they were earning the float profit in both ways, both from the notes in circulation that they weren't paying interest on, and from the uh, account balances of the country banks. The country banks eventually said, we can get a better deal than this, and they organized their own note uh, exchange system. Uh, they called it the Bank for Mutual Redemption. They set up a bank in Boston that they were themselves the shareholders in, uh, it didn't, it, it paid them interest on their accounts or didn't charge them in a sense for the service of uh, redeeming their notes at par. Uh, and that actually seems to be the sort of uh, evolutionarily s surviving mechanism for forming an interbank uh, clearinghouse that the banks themselves become the owner of it uh, so that they aren't exploited by a monopolist. Uh, so it, there is a kind of natural monopoly. There's one clearinghouse, but it's a contestable market so that the customers don't have to pay monopoly prices. Uh, third story. Uh, banks, if, if you start a new bank, and, and this is a story in Scotland, if you start a new bank, uh, when other banks are practicing par acceptance, the first thing you have to do to attract customers is get par acceptance agreements with the other banks lined up so that you can say when you open for business, our notes are accepted all over at par. Similar thing happened uh, in the automatic teller machine business. 
initially Citibank had many, many, many more ATMs than any other bank in New York. And right, so Citibank's advertising pitch was open an account here and you can get your cash at several hundred places throughout Manhattan. Not so much in the outer boroughs. Uh, but hundreds of places. Dime Savings Bank, open an account here, you can withdraw money at three places. Not such a great sales pitch. So Dime and other little banks got together and formed NICE, which stands for the New York Cash Exchange. Very clever. Uh, but it was basically to compete with Citibank by giving Dime's customers access to ATMs at other small banks. And so now they're cooperating to make their account information accessible to each other. There wasn't any law that forced them to do that. Right? They didn't have to accept each other's ATMs, give other banks' customers access to the cash in their own ATM, um, or give other banks the information when their own customers went to a different ATM. And they started doing this even before they figured out that they could charge fees for this service. They did it in order to attract more business. So par acceptance is in the interest of banks. Uh, and so they will promote it in one way or another. Uh, of course, other ATM acceptance networks started. Mostly, they, uh, originally they were local or citywide. They became regional, then became nationwide. Now they're worldwide. Right? So you don't need, if you're going to France, uh, to carry cash with you or even traveler's checks. All you need is your ATM card. And you can get francs uh, anywhere. Oh, sorry, euros. So the banks uh, form a clearinghouse. Uh, banks, through these par acceptance arrangements, are agreeing to accept each other's notes. They're agreeing to accept checks written on other banks. Right? So in the Alice and Bob example, I had them both at the same bank. But suppose they're a bank at different banks. Why would Bob's bank accept a written order from Alice that says that her bank will pay Bob? Uh, well, they'll accept it because her bank and Bob's bank have an agreement that when Bob's bank gets this claim on Alice's account, they bring it back to Alice's bank and Alice's bank pays Bob's bank. Right? And the, way these, the, the place where these claims are cleared, that is they towed up what each bank owes each other, and settled, which means they actually pay what's due on net, is called the clearinghouse. This is a picture of the New York clearinghouse from the late 19th century. It's a bunch of clerks around uh, a set of tables and they visit each other and tote up their uh, bilateral clearing balances and then it's all consolidated into a net clearing balance and if the arithmetic is done right then banks that owe the other banks in the aggregate owe them an amount equal to what the banks that have positive clearing balances are owed by the other banks in the aggregate and the settlement takes place uh, at the clearing house and in the early days of clearing houses they actually would shove gold across the table to make the settlement. But then they figured out, just like Alice and Bob, why bring gold to the clearing and then take it home again? Why don't we just leave it in a vault here at the clearinghouse? We'll create a clearinghouse bank and we'll just trade claims on the clearinghouse bank. And that's what clearinghouse associations did. Uh, it was a more economical way to make payments. These are the kind of results we see historically in places that had little enough regulation of banks to allow it. So places that allowed free entry into banknote issue, that was the, everybody allowed free entry into deposit banking. It was note issue that was more controversial. Did not restrict the capitalization of banks, did not restrict the branching of banks. Uh, these are the kind of results you had. Many note issuers, widespread acceptance of notes at par, uh, and not a lot of bank failures, occasional bank failures. So Scotland is the example I discuss uh, in free banking in Britain, but there's also Canada, Sweden, uh, New England. New England's different from the rest of the United States because it had more liberal entry and it had the Suffolk Bank serving as a clearinghouse, not just for Boston, not just for Massachusetts, but it eventually spread to where they were accepting notes from banks all throughout New England. Yeah, so 1830s to 1850s, it's the Suffolk, and then it's replaced by the Bank for Mutual Redemption. And then in the War for Southern Independence, <laughs> it all changes when federal regulations come in. So this is what I see as the naturally, organically growing 
uh, banking system, many banks of issue. The basic money, though, remains gold or silver. Money does grow on something. Yeah. Uh, the notes circulate at par. They're widely accepted. Uh, there isn't a big problem of banking instability. Of course, that's not the system we have today. Uh, and I think the best explanation is offered by Dave Barry's Money Secrets. Right? Central banks were established. Originally, their notes were redeemable for gold, but then they discovered that it's easier to back them with something that's easier to come by, namely nothing. Uh, so dollars are no longer redeemable for gold or silver. Uh, allegedly, there still is gold in Fort Knox, but as Dave Barry goes on to say, if you show up to visit your gold at Fort Knox, <laughs> you will be attacked by a federal bulldog. <laughs> Uh, the Golden Fort Knox has not been audited since the Eisenhower administration. So for all we know, Fort Knox is filled with cream cheese. <laughs> now, when I talk about free banking, let me be clear, I'm not talking about the systems in the United States called free banking. There were so-called free banking laws passed by several states, actually the majority of states before the war. Uh, and here's a banknote from New York, and what distinguishes it is this line at the bottom, secured by pledge of public stocks. So under the so-called free banking law, uh, anybody could start a bank provided that they deposited with the public authorities certain specified kinds of assets that would be used to redeem the notes in the event that the bank failed. So the kind of collateral is deposited with uh, the public authorities, a kind of compulsory note collateralization. And what asset do you think was most popular with the state government? State bonds. <laughs> they figured out that they could sell their state bonds to the bank by requiring them to be held as collateral. And the federal government, sorry, the union government, uh, during the unpleasantness, said, uh, we need somebody to lend us money. They're getting reluctant to lend us any more in London. What can we do? Wow. Some of the states have forced their banks to lend the state government money. We can do the same thing. Let's allow federal bank charters, provided that you lend the federal government money. So that was the deal of the National Banking Acts passed uh, during the war. Uh, 1828. Is that, sorry, no, no, sorry, 1838. Uh, the first Free Banking Act was actually passed by Michigan. Literally, people uh, from Michigan saw the, got hold of the bill that was being debated in New York and rushed it into passage. Uh, New York, 1838, and then other states came along later. Uh, it did make bank entry freer, and it had good results for bank competition because of that. So banking was improving uh, despite the restriction on branching and despite the compulsory collateralization. Uh, so here's a, bank, a balance sheet for a bank of issue. Uh, it's got reserves. Reserve, among its assets, it's got reserves and it's got loans. Among its liabilities, it's got notes and then deposits D. And it's got some amount of capital or net worth or equity, which is the difference between the value of its assets and the value of its liabilities. Right? That's what the shareholders originally contributed to start the bank plus retained earnings. Uh, and the whole theory of what regulates the amount of notes a bank can issue uh, sort of turns on the balance sheet and the balance sheet identity, which says you can't expand your assets, you can't make more loans and thereby earn more interest unless you either reduce your reserve assets or you attract more liability holders. Uh, so we need an argument as to why the bank wouldn't want to reduce its reserves down to zero. And the argument is simply that if there's a legal penalty for defaulting on your obligation to pay depositors back, then you have an incentive to hold reserves in order to reduce the probability of having to pay that penalty. Uh, so the optimal reserve ratio is not zero for the bank. It does give up a little bit of interest income, but it reduces the expected penalty from running out of reserves. 
right? So at some point, uh, and if you sort of draw a distribution of possible reserve losses and you see that it's humped in the middle, you see that there's a declining marginal benefit of holding reserves. But the benefit of holding the first dollar of reserves is pretty great. Because if you've got zero reserves and it's random whether somebody shows up to deposit money or withdraw money, you've got a 50% chance of running out of reserves with the next guy who shows up. So that first increment of reserves is pretty valuable uh, and so on. But you hold some positive amount of reserves based on uh, your estimate of how probable it is that more people will show up than the amount of reserves you're holding. Uh, the other way you can make more interest income is to have more notes or deposits in circulation. It's pretty clear that it's costly to attract more depositors. You've got to pay more interest, and you've got to open more branches, and you've got to hire more tellers. And plausibly, there are rising marginal costs to expanding your market share that way. So there's a point beyond which a bank doesn't want to grow. So that sets a limit to the amount of depositors it wants to have. It's, it's always happy to take new depositors if it doesn't have to do anything to attract them, if they just walk in. But there's a limit to how much it wants to, how many depositors it wants to attract of the kind that are costly to attract. The same thing is true of note holders. Uh, the way Mises explained it was, suppose every uh, person has a preferred bank. So each bank has a clientele of people who are willing to hold its notes. Then it's costly to attract more people because you have to expand your clientele. Uh, that, that sort of captures it simply, but it's not actually uh, the way people behave in systems of multiple note issuers. And I discovered this by uh, going to Belfast every year and teaching at Queen's University. Uh, if you want to see a picture of Queen's University, by the way, you get a hold of an old Bank of Ireland note. The, the most beautiful building on the Queen's University campus was on the back, back of the uh, Bank of Ireland notes. They replaced it two years ago, and uh, I would have been sad about it, but what they replaced it with was a picture of the Bushmills distillery. So <laughs> I can't fault them for that. Uh, but when notes are interchangeable at par, people don't really have strong preferences. Oh, if I'm being, I, I refuse to be paid change in the notes of this other bank. No, it's worth the same. People are pretty much indifferent, uh, I discovered. But what determines the share of the note circulation a bank has is basically how many depositors it has. Because the way notes get into circulation is by depositors withdrawing cash. So people depositing their excess currency at the end of the day and withdrawing currency to refill their wallets when their wallets run out. So retailers depositing excess cash and customers, ordinary people uh, topping up their cash balances, acts as a kind of a filtering mechanism. And it's, it's as that the takes out notes uh, from banks that have smaller clientele uh, and keeps the note circulation proportions pretty much in line with the deposit uh, proportions. It's, it's as though people had definite preferences among brands of banknotes. So when that's the case, it's costly to expand your note clientele. And this hasn't always been understood by economists. Uh, some have thought that there's this danger that if you let any bank issue as many notes as they want, you'll soon be flooded with banknotes. Well, as long as the banks are redeemable, that's not true. It's costly to issue more notes if you haven't cultivated a bigger demand to hold them, you're going to start running out of reserves. And you're going to pass the point at which you feel safe with the reserves you've got. And you can say, oh, stop. I, don't, I can't afford to lose any more reserves. I need to stop trying to expand my note circulation. Or I need to increase the demand to hold my notes, which is costly to do. Uh, I had a, a correspondence exchange with a, a well-known economist named Neil Wallace. Uh, he had this theory that the only reason people hold currency when it doesn't pay interest and other assets do is that there must be some legal restriction. And I said, no. In the 19th century, there was no legal restriction, and people held non-interest bearing banknotes. And he said, I don't understand. A bank could make unlimited profits if it can issue non-interest bearing notes and acquire interest bearing assets. He seemed to think there was you know, no limit to the amount of notes you could issue. Well, look, when they're redeemable, it's one thing to issue more notes. It's a second thing to get them to stay in circulation. That's costly. 
And that's what you have to do if you're going to finance uh, loans on your balance sheet. It's no good to issue the notes and have them come in for redemption. That means you're financing the loans by giving up reserves, but we've already established you don't want to give up all your reserves. So there is a definite limit to how many notes a bank wants to circulate given the cost of keeping them in circulation. If a bank overissues, uh, the excess notes are going to come back for redemption. Uh, this mechanism by which excess notes come back for redemption was uh, historically described as the reflux mechanism because people used words like that in the 19th century. <laughs> right, so when notes are issued, that's the outflow or the efflux. When they come back, that's the reflux. Of course, I went to the Google image search engine for a picture of reflux. <laughs> you don't want to see it. Because <laughs> right, the only way we use the term now is acid reflux. But uh, think of it this way. This is a uh, reverse bungee jump. Right? So they had this little capsule attached by bungee cords to these towers, and without anybody in it, they pull it down to the platform. Maybe you've seen these at uh, some fairs. So they've got it stretched down there, ready for you to climb in. <laughs> then they push the button and release it, and it takes off in the upward direction. But there's a limit to how high it goes. Right? There, there's something, yeah, and you're strapped into the little bubble, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no limit to how high you go. Uh, so the, the whole theory of what corrects an overissue is a theory of what's the restraint on you know, how far this thing can go. Uh, but you get the following kind of nice feature that the, in a free banking system, that the quantity of notes has a certain amount of elasticity, meaning it responds as the archaic term for this feature. It responds to the quantity of money people want to hold. So if a particular bank becomes more popular, it will expand its note issue. It has more customers now. Other banks will have to contract because they have fewer customers now. If there's a general demand by the public to hold more currency, all the banks, if the shares don't change, all the banks can expand their note issue a little bit. They'll be happy to do so because they'll earn more interest income. Under the assumption that people want to hold these notes and not spend them quite so frequently, uh, there isn't any greater threat to the bank of running out of reserves because these notes are not entering the clearing system and posing a threat to its reserves. So why is it desirable to issue more notes when the public wants to hold more notes or issue more bank-issued money in general when the public wants to hold more bank-issued money? Well, uh, Steve Horowitz's lecture on monetary equilibrium theory already uh, address that question. The alternative is the way people increase their real balances is the price level has to fall. That's a relatively painful process. Uh, just as under a pure gold coin system, the kind David Hume theorized about, if people want to hold more gold coins, they'll buy them from the rest of the world and the money supply will grow as enough coins flow in to satisfy the demand. Nobody objects to the money supply in the nation growing in that case, when people are willing to hold more bank-issued money, uh, the supply will be forthcoming, and there's no reason to object to that. Right? It won't be an unlimited supply. It'll be only in proportion to what people want to hold, and that saves the economy from more difficult ways of, of satisfying that demand. Now, this is all assuming the notes are redeemable so that excess notes don't stay in circulation. When you cut off redeemability, you can't let banks issue all the notes they want to issue because then you will be flooded with notes and there's no way to get them out of circulation. And that's the situation we have today, except, of course, we only have one issuer, and that's the central bank. And they can issue as much as they want because they're under no constraint uh, to redeem the notes. The Bank of England's notes, by the way, still say we'll pay the bearer on demand 10 pounds if it's a 10-pound note. And if you take it to the Bank of England, what happens? Well, you get turned away at the door, but... Supposing they did honor their uh, obligation, what would they give you? Two five-pound notes <laughs> or ten one-pound coins, but no longer redeemable for anything not issued by the bank. Uh, well, I've, I've kind of run out of time, but I wanted to say about the problem of runs on the banks that it depends on what kind of contract the bank has issued, what kind of uh, deposit arrangement you have uh, or 
banknote arrangement. Uh, so in order for it to make sense for you to want to get to the bank ahead of everybody else, that's why it's a run and not a walk. Uh, and it, here's another Google image search engine anecdote. If you put bank run <laughs> into the Google image search engine, you get a lot of pictures of banks that have sponsored 10K runs. <laughs> you think they would think twice about this. Right? <laughs> right? The Bank of Jonesville run. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, if you've seen the bank run scene in Mary Poppins, you know that you don't want to spread the idea that the bank is uh, subject to a run. Uh, so for it to make s sense for you to want to get there ahead of everybody else, you have a debt claim that is you're entitled to a certain number of dollars. It's not contingent on how well the bank is doing. So if you hear, for example, that the bank has suffered losses and doesn't have enough to pay everybody back, you want to get there ahead of everybody else. Uh, you have the right to redeem it without any conditions now, in which case the bank has to pay you in the order you arrive, first come, first served, and you suspect that default is likely for the last person who shows up. Under those conditions, it is rational for you to run the bank. So how can a bank make the bank account less run prone, non-run prone? Modify any one of these conditions, because it's all three together that create run proneness. So don't issue a debt claim, issue an equity claim. Money market mutual funds do that. They're not run prone. Uh, secondly, put conditions on redemption. Uh, the first time I opened a bank account, I got a little passbook, and I, I read the inside cover of the passbook, and it said, uh, you have to give us 90 days notice if you want to withdraw money. And I said to the bank teller, hey, I don't want this kind of account. I want an account that I can withdraw on demand. And she said, oh, you can withdraw on demand. We just have this language in there. Uh, ignore that. We never invoke that. I said, well, why is the language in here? And she said, are you familiar with the problem of bank runs? <laughs> no, she didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> she said, I don't know. But back in the days when bank runs were a problem, banks put these kind of notice of withdrawal clauses in, and then they normally ignored them, unless too many people showed up to withdraw. And then they said, you have to wait. Now, as a customer, why would you agree to this you have to wait option? And the answer is because you don't want other people emptying the bank out before you get there. So this prevents other customers from emptying the bank before you can get paid back. You would agree to it. Uh, some banks, when they were subject to raids, like the Royal Bank and Bank of Scotland, put the same clause on their banknotes. We'll pay the bearer on demand, asterisk, or at the option of the bank, six months after you demand with interest. Uh, but the main thing that banks did was to reduce people's anxiety about the last person in line not being paid back. So call that solvency assurances. And the main thing they did was they held ad adequate capital. Banks used to advertise in the newspaper by saying, deposit your money here because we have $5 million in capital. No bank ever puts that in its ad nowadays. Banks used to paint in their window, this bank has $5 million in capital. Now what do they put? FDIC, FDIC right? They scrape off the gold paint and they put FDIC. FDIC is a substitute for bank capital. Since deposit insurance began, bank capital has declined as far as the FDIC will allow it to decline because now it's the FDIC that's at risk if the bank fails, not the depositors. Uh, they held much safer assets. You didn't get a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage from banks in the days where banks were concerned about meeting redemption demands. They didn't lend money at 30 years at fixed rate. They held short-term, so no interest rate risk, safe, very little default risk, liquid assets so that if they started to run out of reserves, they could very quickly replenish them by selling off some of their commercial paper or securities. Uh, the loan portfolio was pretty small. Uh, if you wanted a mortgage, you had to go to a savings bank, which financed it with long-term deposits, uh, time deposits. In some banking systems, they had extended liability for shareholders. We already saw that on the Provincial Bank of Ireland note. But some banks had that, where if the bank couldn't pay back the depositors, a letter went out to the shareholders saying you have to chip in more money. Uh, and in the U.S., where banks were kind of rickety because of the restrictions on bank branching in particular, join a clearinghouse and the clearinghouse will certify 
that you're solvent because you don't want to join a clearinghouse with other banks that haven't been certified for solvency. So banks agreed to clearinghouses not only demanding their balance sheet from them, but actually sending in auditors. The first bank examinations were privately arranged. Uh, they were not arranged by the government. Questions? The interest comes from, oh, sorry, the question is, how can a fractional reserve bank pay interest? Where does the interest come from? I mean, you can pay, like, notes back, but yeah, in a full reserve bank system, you get, basically, you get gold, and you pay gold back in a little bit more gold, but if you're allowed... No, no, sorry, in, in, a, in a, what you're calling a full reserve banking system, what I would call a money warehouse, yeah, yeah. in a money warehouse, you, you don't get more back than you put in. How can they afford to pay you more back? It's no, just sitting in the, the vault. Yeah, no, that, well, that wouldn't be kind of reserve. Have, like, bank time deposit. Oh, right, you time deposit. Yeah, oh, in a time deposit, sure. But what does any fractional reserve bank do? So, what do I pay back, basically? So, okay, so the question is, uh, in a, if a bank offers a demand deposit, how can they afford to pay interest on it? Where are they getting the interest from? Yeah. They're getting the interest from lending out some of the money that was deposited. Right? Uh, they are counting on the fact that not all the deposits will be called for, and so they can lend them out. Now, for what term can they lend them out safely? Well, they have to learn that through experience, but what banks in the 19th century did, as I was just saying, was they lent them out at very short terms, and they lent them typically on not idiosyncratic loans to Joe's Pizza Parlor, where if Joe doesn't pay us back, we're stuck, but IOUs, so-called bills of exchange, or what today we call commercial paper, that had a liquid secondary market. So if they need more, re to more reserves, they could sell that to some other bank or sell it into the market uh, and get more reserves. But they are earning interest. Right? So they buy these uh, IOUs from businesses at a discount, and so as it approaches maturity, it gains interest. So the interest rates are lower on demand deposits than time deposits, because demand deposits are more costly, because the bank does need more reserves, so it has less interest income, and it's investing in safer, shorter term assets, that means they're earning less, a lower uh, yield on those assets than on long term loans that they can uh, afford to finance with time deposits. Right? So the bank is doing a certain amount of what bankers like to call maturity transformation, or if you don't like it, maturity mismatching. <laughs> right? They are if, you're, if you have a demand deposit, you are borrowing as short as you can possibly borrow. And if you're lending at anything more than overnight, you're lending a little bit longer than the money you're borrowing. But banks have to be careful not to let that get out of hand. And a prudent bank will lend on assets that it can immediately realize should the need arise. Right? So the, the demand deposit is not just backed, backed by the gold in the vault, but by all the assets that can be sold for gold. Right? So in the sense that the bank has assets that exceeds its liabilities, it has more than 100% backing. Right? As long as the bank is solvent, it has more than 100% backing for its liabilities. Yeah, question. Um, earlier in your talk, you the, the line where you basically started off by saying that uh, there's, you could loan, give the bank the money and uh, have, it, have a deposit where you're kind of getting it back a year or a week or a day or right. at any time afterwards. Right. And uh, those, all those things seem very different than getting it back at any time afterwards. You kind of put those together. Um, and that, to me, is a demand deposit. So in other words, you, you can retrieve the money on demand. Right. Um, well, how does a bank make a loan then? I understand if they have the, the deposit for a year or any amount of specified time, that they can make a loan for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. If the money is available for people on demand, then how can they make any type of loan on that? Like, in other words, if it wasn't a bank and I gave you money, Okay, so the question again is, uh, 
how can a bank loan money when it's obliged to repay on demand? They could be asked to repay at any time. Well, so the bank has to make an estimate of what percentage of these deposits are actually going to be redeemed in the next week, then I don't want to have less available in the next week than I need to repay those depositors. So the bank has to, in a sense, estimate in practice how long are those deposits left at the bank before they actually are redeemed. So it, it has to estimate a kind of implicit term on average to what are legally demand deposits can be redeemed at any time, but in practice aren't redeemed at every moment, then it can, it's feasible, as, as in the contrast between uh, bread tickets and banknotes, uh, the same thing would apply to deposits, it is feasible to lend some share of those out and still meet all the redemption demands that are actually made. Uh, yeah? I wasn't aware I was making a proposal, but go ahead. So, putting the fraud asi argument aside, uh, the question is, if banks practice fractional reserve banking, won't it be the case that they mismatch savings with investment, that there will be unwarranted credit expansion and therefore set in motion the Austrian business cycle? Is that roughly the question? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, look, let, let's take a simple case. Uh, suppose people decide to hold more time deposits, right? So they lend their money to the bank, and the bank then intermediates that into loans, right? In order to expand the quantity of loans, the bank has to lower the banking system lowers the interest rate a little bit, but that's okay because there's been an increase in the supply of loanable funds. It hasn't driven the market interest rate below the equilibrium interest rate. The equilibrium interest rate has changed, right? I'm talking about time deposits now. So, so I, I thought you were going to, so, so you, you would apply this to time deposits too? Time deposits need to be back to 100%? Time deposits is basically just a service Okay, well that, that was the case I was trying to describe. So let, let me finish, right? So, uh, sorry. Uh, if people decide to save more by opening time deposits, Right? There's an increase in the amount of loans that banks can make, but there's no distortion of the interest rate. 
if there's an increase in the supply of loanable funds, it's okay for the interest rate to drop. Right? We continue to have uh, equilibrium in the, between the supply and demand for loanable funds. All right, so if people decide to open demand deposits, they are acquiring claims on banks that amount to providing loanable funds to the banking system, which the banking system will then intermediate into loans. Now the question is, has this, is this different somehow? Is this driving the interest rate in the market below the natural rate? Well, if people are holding uh, bank deposits as a voluntary uh, kind of saving, if instead of spending the money, instead of consumption, they are holding larger bank claims, it is a form of saving. And so banks that expand the supply of credit because people are willing to hold more bank liabilities are not creating a disequilibrium. Right, so there are occasions in which the banks can expand the amount of credit without creating a disequilibrium. It isn't necessary for the quantity of bank liabilities to be fixed, regardless of whether we're talking about depo uh, time deposit liabilities or demand deposit liabilities. Right, it's, it's the case of time deposits taken to the limit where the time is whenever you show up to redeem it. Um, so, and that's the basic argument as to why it doesn't set in motion the Austrian business cycle. The Austrian business cycle is set in motion when the interest rate is distorted below the equilibrium rate by credit being created without any matching willingness uh, to supply loanable funds to the financial system. Right? But people who are willingly holding bank liabilities and who have acquired them by giving up consumption are in a sense, expressing a lower time preference. Well, the mechanism. Yeah, another question? Last one. It, it, it's just related to the uh, I've heard this concept of this multiplication factor sometimes. You know, yeah. Like the, the, the central bank will issue a, money, uh, a certain amount of money, and that actually multiplies once it gets out there. Yeah. So maybe you could just touch on that and clarify the consumption. Okay, so. Uh, in a central banking system under fiat money, there, there certainly is a money multiplier. That is, if the Federal Reserve goes out and creates more bank reserves and abstract from what's happened in the last year where banks are sitting on huge amounts of reserves for reasons that are not well understood, but uh, go back to the old days where the Fed didn't pay interest on reserves uh, and suppose the banks are fully loaned up if the, bank, if the central bank creates $1,000 in new reserves, uh, the first bank that gets them can make, if it wants to hold 10% reserves, can hold $100 in reserves and make $900 in loans. And in making those loans, it creates new checking accounts. Right? The way it makes a loan is, here's an account with $900 in it. Uh, that customer spends the loan. The $900 ends up in another bank and increases that bank's reserves. It can now make loans of $810 and so on and so forth. And at a 10% reserve ratio, the $1,000 in new reserves isn't used up until $10,000 in new deposits have been created. Right? So the, the amount of required or desired reserves rises until it reaches 1,000. And if it's a 10 to 1 ratio, that takes $10,000 in new deposit creation. Now. Uh, in a, a fractional reserve system based on gold, uh, the equivalent would have to be that new gold flows into the economy and is lodged in the banks uh, by people who want to keep bank accounts. And then you could have uh, an expansion. Uh, or there's a shift in the public's preferences between holding gold and holding uh, bank liabilities. Um, and then you can have an expansion based on fractional reserves, which is a multiple of the amount that's been deposited. Uh, and then the question of sort of what are the knock-on effects uh, depend on whether this represents an increased desire, increased willingness to save or not. In the case where the central bank expands, there's no reason to think that there's an increased desire to save uh, as uh, Roger Garrison explained yesterday, it's just padding the uh, supply of savings with uh, unbacked money. Uh, but 
if you look at it in, in a competitive, in a free banking system from the point of view of any one bank, it's not at liberty to expand by a multiple of the new reserves it gets um, because it's costly for it to attract new deposits or attract new reserves. It, it's sort of not expanding ad lib the way a central bank is in an unbacked system that doesn't have to do anything to get people to hold the additional money. Uh, it just showers it down on them. So the, the expansion of credit is gratuitous when a central bank does it. It's costless to the central bank. Not the same in a competitive bank that has to compete uh, to get reserves. It's costly for that kind of bank to expand. So there isn't the gratuitous creation of credit. Uh, we're, we're out of time. Thank okay. you very much.